Good morning, good morning, good morning, the way Berkeley is Pastor Jazz bringing you great greetings from the way Los Angeles. I am so excited to be in the house of the Lord with all of you this morning. I just can't stop smiling. It's so good to be here in the house of the Lord with you all. Let's pray. Oh God, I thank you. I thank you for your love. I thank you for the joy that we experience with you. God, I thank you for your power, for your strength. God, thank you for your protection. Thank you for keeping us. God, in the midst of things seen and unseen, God, thank you for being with us, for holding us in moments of uncertainty, in moments of bliss, in moments of confusion. God, whatever the multitude of feelings we may be feeling, God, you are with us. You love us. You say that we are yours. And God, we thank you for that. We thank you, God, for this moment that we all get to be here in community together. Um, And we thank you for this preaching moment. And God, I pray that the words from my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight, oh God. You are our rock and our redeemer. And I pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Luke. We are headed to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. Again, that's Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. Some of you, listen, I still have my Bibles. And so I'll be reading from my Bible from the NRSV version. Um, There is probably going to be something on the screen here so you can follow along from there. It reads, again, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he, then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb. Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elisha when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them 
except to a widow in Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of God for the people of God and all of God's people said, thanks be to God. This passage of scripture has so many fascinating aspects to it, but there's two specific fascinating aspects to me. Something that every time I look at this passage, I usually get curious about a couple of things. The first thing I'm curious about is why did the people get so mad? What enraged them? What made them want to throw Jesus off of a cliff? What is it that Jesus said that made them so upset? Right? What is it? What is it? So let's look back at this passage a little bit. After being filled with the Holy Spirit and tested by the devil, Jesus heads to his hometown of Nazareth. Jesus is where he grew up. And he attends church. He attends the synagogue, which was his typical custom as a Palestinian Jew. This is what Jesus was already doing. Now he's in his hometown. He heads to the synagogue, stands up to read the attendant, and the attendant hands him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Jesus unrolls the scroll and goes to a very particular place to let his community know that the kingdom of God is here right now. The time is now to preach good news to the poor. The time is now to set the burden and battered free. The time is now to announce this is God's time to shine. Then Jesus essentially pulls a, I said what I said moment, right? Hands the scroll back to the attendant, sits down for a moment, and everybody is in awe of Jesus. Everyone's like, wow, okay. Um, and then Jesus says something along the lines of, yeah, to be crystal clear, just so you know, you have just heard scripture make history in this moment, in this place, right? You've just heard scripture make history. It came true just now in this place. I imagine Jesus looking everyone in their eyes as he shares this and the people feel the power of God's spirit through his words and they are just amazed. A little old Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, a few people must have caught themselves and been like, wait a minute. And this is what the scripture says. Wait a minute, isn't that, isn't that Joseph and Mary's son? The one we knew since he was a little, little kid? Jesus then starts speaking some truths to the crowd that doesn't sound like that they wanted to hear. Jesus says, look, I bet you all are now expecting me to perform a miracle for y'all, like what you've heard me do in Capranium. And Jesus is like, no, I'm not doing that. I have learned from prophets that came before me that a lot of people who know prophets 
do not accept us or believe us, is what Jesus is saying. Jesus then gives them a few examples that I believe he knew they would know these specific examples. And here is where we get to answering our question or the fascination that I have as to why the folks got so mad. <laughs> what these particular stories in scripture were highlighting was that Elijah and Elisha were performing miracles, not for people in their hometown, but for the foreigner, to the outsider, to the outcast, to the marginalized person, to the person who was living on the edge of society. Jesus is sharing and telling his hometown that all the marginalized people who society rejects, who maybe even folks in that community were actively rejecting, that I came for them too. Not just y'all, but for them too. So the people in his hometown that were hearing this sermon and hearing Jesus' proclama proclamations were not necessarily upset at his proclamation of being God's child who has come, who's here, who's the one they've all been waiting for, but they get enraged, enraged to the level of wanting to kill Jesus because other marginalized people were a part of the deal? My Lord. <laughs> This truth, this truth that Jesus proclaimed resulted in everybody in the church participating in dragging Jesus outside of the church towards the hill or the cliff where the city was built with intent to throw him off with intent to kill. What a devastating story. In a coming out moment where Jesus has returned to his hometown to speak of the good news of liberation to everybody to share his truth, to share this reality, specifically with those who knew him. In that moment, in that precious moment, his life is threatened and an attempt to end his life is made. His community attempts to throw him off the edge of a cliff. What a devastating story. And that brings me to the second fascinating piece of this passage of scripture for me, and that is the very last verse, verse 30, that reads, but he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Jesus somehow navigated the edge of a cliff. How? How does Jesus <laughs> navigate the edge, how does Jesus navigate the edge? I happen to know, and you most certainly happen to know several groups of people, but today I'm talking specifically about a particular group of people who know a little 
bit of something about navigating life on the edge. How do we LGBTQIA plus people, and of course others on the margins of society, navigate the edge of life and death, particularly amongst our own communities that often are pushing us, my Lord, pushing us towards death more than life. How, how are we navigating this edge? When we live in a country that makes Juneteenth a national holiday in place of reparations, in a country where there is a push to ban critical race theory in schools, and our country is seeing the most sweeping voter suppression efforts in at least 80 years. A country and world where Black, trans, and gender non-conforming intersex people are routine targets of harassment by police and are disproportionately likely to live in extreme poverty. When just last year, 2020 was the diddliest year on record for violence against transgender and gender non-conforming people. How, Pastor Jazz, are we navigating this deadly edge? My God, how? Whew. We navigate this edge by moving through it liberatively. We navigate this edge by living there liberatively. This takes me to another important piece of this passage of scripture when Jesus reads from Isaiah 61. I'd like to believe that Jesus's reading of the Isaiah 61 passage was not a coincidence, but a call to those of us on the margins who navigate the edge miraculously. And Jesus is saying to us that the kingdom of God is here right now, right now. The Isaiah 61 passage is a proclamation of release. The time is now for good news to the oppressed. The time is now to bind up the broken heart at the time is now to proclaim liberty to the captives. The time is now to release the prisoners. The time is now somebody ought to look at their neighbor and say the time is now. Jesus is reading of the Isaiah 61 passage that sets off the beginning of his violent journey to the edge was meant to disrupt the status quo and to establish liberative living on the edge and the preaching of this text in this moment is meant to do the same. So how, how saints of the living God are we going to live liberatively on the edge? First, the world must, the world must Proclaim release to those of us living on the margins, those of us living on the edge, those of us who identify as queer, trans, and non-binary people. Proclaim release to us by recognizing the devastating conditions of life on the edge. And the world must provide us with restoration and restoration and reparations. The world must continue to resist 
anti-Blackness, white supremacy, racism, colonization, colonized Christianity, ableism, homophobia, xenophobia, and all the other isms and all the other phobias so that those on the edge, those of us living on the edge of society have opportunities to rest. Second, the world must realize and recognize that those of us living on the edge have somehow, my Lord, somehow made a way out of no way. We have somehow looked to the hills from which cometh our health. We have somehow navigated the reality that the joy the bits of joy that we may find on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, the bits of joy that we may find, the world did not give it to us and the world cannot and will not take it away. The world must realize and recognize that the edge is a mystical place, a mysterious place, a place that continuously is making ways for endless possibilities in this miraculous way. Thirdly, and I'm almost done, the edge must be navigated carefully, closely, and continuously because the edge is where the past, present, and the future meet. The edge is where the marginalized can thrive liberatively if we have what we want, if we have what we need, if we have what we desire, if we have what we deserve. Lastly, the edge is where Jesus lives with us liberatively. The edge is where Jesus navigates with us and provides provisions and revisions with us and helps us envision future possibilities of our marginalized bodies, of our queer and trans and gender non-conforming bodies. Jesus is with us and living with us living this life liberatively on the edge. And so people of God, let's go liberatively. Amen. <laughs>